Today we're going to concentrate on market requirements and turning them into what's called product requirements. Okay? These things will always affect you. It doesn't matter whether you have a technical roadmap or a non-technical roadmap, these things will affect you. Okay? So it's really, we're going to go through some of the theory behind it, what it is, how to do it, how to capture them correctly. Okay? Make sense? Yeah? Before I start, one more housekeeping. One thing we will do with you today before we all uh, you know, uh, depart, I'd like to go through your elevator pitches. Just one more time, so be prepared for that. Reason being, you guys are going off on a jolly, I mean, you're all going off on a trip to uh, Dubai, right? To Gentex. Gentex? I keep calling it Gentex. You guys need to have this down, okay? You're not only just going to meet potential investors, you're going to meet a bunch of senior execs from STC who are investing in this division, right? So you're representing Inspire You as well. So get it down, get your message down and make it clear and articulate, articulate it well, he says, without articulating well. All right, okay. So this is, if you remember, the things that we're trying to do is we get, that's changed. Uh, the business plan alignment, you know, as you're pulling all of this together, is just around, I say, market requirements and uh, you know, turning those into product requirements, all right? Okay, but wait, and I mean wait. Why are we doing all this? Why are we doing all this marketing stuff? Anybody care to guess? Well, oh, we've got to sit through it because we've got to get our money and then, you know. Right, and it might be that reason, and that's okay if that's what it is for you, but why, there is a reason why we're doing all this. God, I should pay you to be my wingman. All right, you've got your mission statement, you've got your elevator pitch, you've done some market segmentation, you're defining your customer, your competitive landscape, you've worked on your SWOT analysis, we're gonna help you do changes to your product, right, or define the product. All of that goes into something which is this, right, the go-to market plan. We've spent four days doing strategy, okay, now it's time to turn that strategy into tactics, all right? And it really, really, I can't emphasize this enough, okay? The strategy is really important, but you've got to turn it at some stage, you've got to put a stake in the ground and go, okay, now I know this, I know this, I know this, everything is based around that and I'm gonna go hedge my bets on that approach. Make sense? All right, again, SWOT analysis, just so that you guys, you know, um, I felt maybe we didn't do a great job of explaining the SWOT to you and you had to go off and do this on your own, so I threw this in here again, okay? Just to kind of give you a little bit of a feel for what really is behind the SWOT. I think you've, you've, from the, the guys that I've, you know, and ladies that I've spent some time with, you've done some really good stuff. Be very proud of yourselves. We were saying over dinner last night, think back to the beginning of last week, yeah? Think back to the beginning of last week. It was, so what do you tell, remember the first phrase I said, tell me what you do, <laughs> right? Give yourselves a pat on the back for how far you've come and what you've done and really from the positioning of understanding what you're trying to do. You've come an extremely long way, okay? Seriously, I'm very, very impressed with what you guys have put together. But, you know, again, work, work through this, do SWOT analysis on yourself. Right? What are your own individual strengths? What are you bringing to your company? What are your own weaknesses? Hey, I, you know what? I'm the best programmer in the world, but I don't think I could run a company for Toffee. Right? I don't think I'm good at an accountant. I let my wife do all of the, you know, our, our own accounting. It bores me silly, right? But there's certain, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. Find the team that complements your weaknesses. Right? You can't be good at everything. It's just physically impossible in the startup. Um, again, from the threats, you know, look at your competition, keep doing it, keep refining it all the time, right? Figure stuff out, again, who are your competitors? It will, that, that landscape will constantly change. All right, as I said, we're gonna turn, what you've gotta do is you've gotta turn the strategy into tactics, okay? Your marketing plan, remember this is different now from just marketing theory, Right? This is what you guys have to do. We're not going to put a check in the box against it. We don't want to see it. Right? But this is what we're leading towards. Okay? You've got half of this. Define your market. 
your target uh, market segments, your key customer attributes. Right? Key customer attri attributes. I'm going to say to you that get as granular as you can and keep going. Okay? What I saw was, you know, a great attempt. Please don't get me wrong, a great attempt of the things that you, you've been defining as your customers, right? But it's still too broad from my perspective. If I was, you know, the VP of marketing from your company, if I was the CEO, I'd be saying, go away, I need to know exactly down, right down to the granular detail as to who my customer is. Okay? So do spend some more time on that. And by the way, that customer may be different in two years' time. You just don't know right now. Is that what you did as the perfect customer when you had like, when you had like the needs, the wants, the perception? Yeah. But the, the, the areas that it lacked for me, right, just personally, again, I would get right down into the economic you know, spend that these guys have, right? You know, what do they typically sp Let me back up. So, for you it's going to be slightly different, and I'll actually go into yours in a little while. But if you're selling, you know, services to a home environment, right, where you have to get to is, I want to get right down to the, you know what, I told you my base of customer was 25 to 45. Well, in there, there may be, the people who actually buy from me are 29 years old. You're going to, you've got to get right down to that. 29 years old that earn, I'm going to put it in dollars, $100,000 a year that live in a certain neighborhood that spend $1,000 of expendable income of $1,000, and out of that $1,000, they spend $200 on services like this a month, right? That's who I'm targeting specifically. You've got to get down to that level of granularity. You think about the seal and service, so you guys are you know, delivering things to people that you need to know exactly how much they spend, how many cars they have, you probably need you people that just have one car to a family. Because if that car is out, how's somebody going to go to the grocery? You need to understand, as he says, just down to the specific details, get as absolutely granular as you possibly can. So from micro to micro level. Yeah. And th there is a reason for doing this. It isn't just theory. It isn't just, you know, a, a class in marketing. Because then you're going to build up your marketing plan around it, right? That 25-year-old you know, buys Nike clothes and therefore I'm going to get all of my, and they live in a certain neighborhood or a certain part of the country, therefore I'm going to understand the IP addresses and make sure my marketing is targeted towards that neck of the woods for people who shop at Nike, right? You see where I'm going with all of this? Yeah? You will always get people on the outside of that, but you need to get laser focus as to who is the one that's going to give you money. Now. All the other guys around the outside are going to give you money, but focus, laser focus to the ones that, where you've got your best bang for the buck. Yeah? Makes, does that make sense? Yeah. So no, 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 no. I mean, you're selling to people that buy high-end perfume, is that your target? Or are you going to somebody in that middle tier? Get down right into the specifics of it. So, you know, once you've got that and your value proposition, you know what your offering is, well, you know, how the hell are you going to get it to market? I mean, as uh, sorry, as you guys grow and grow and grow, right, distribution becomes a huge issue for you. Logistics that surround that becomes a huge issue. How do you service that? How do you not service that? How do you get, you know, fresh vegetables from A to B in a timely manner across the whole city? I, you know, I haven't got a clue, right? But that's a big logistics problem that you hopefully will face. All right. I'm going to keep going with this, right? We're talking about marketing, and when you, you see me again in a couple of weeks, we're going to bring that into this thing over here. They're very different things, right? It's how do you prepare your salespeople to go out and sell for you? Okay, it's really, really important. Now we're into not just the value messages about your company, we're into the value about your product and positioning that to the value of your customer. Okay? There's a lot to it. Yeah? And right now, you are, you know, one person, three people, five people in the company. Yeah? But you've got to get that messaging right because then everybody stands behind it. We're going to take you through this, right? This financial modeling around marketing and sales. It's all great that, you know, we've done all this theory and we've done all this marketing, but, you know, you've got limited funds. How are you going to spend it? What are you going to spend it on? 
What are you going to budget for marketing? Hey, I've got some customers. Great, we've got some revenue coming in. How much of that revenue should I allocate right now? Yeah, all of it, none of it, yeah. Here's a prime example, right? And I'm going to uh, just mention Tanim as an example, right? You, hopefully, you're going to come through this exercise. You're going to get your first check for 20,000 real. First thing you have to do is put up a company website and a company email, right? As opposed to a Gmail. If you've got Gmail accounts, get rid of them. You need to look professional, right? Simple as that, yeah? Again, I, I, I applaud you for where you've got to today, but now it's the real world, right? Now you're going to start being professional. It's business. All right, so, okay. Will. I don't know what that means. <laughs> that got changed, sorry. Okay. Um, this is your, uh, so if we look at the marketing plan, what you're going to put into it, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but you've really got to design, define your key purchasing factors, right? right this is another change. Um, the, key, the key, your key purchasing reasons, why does my customer want to buy from me? Yeah? What do I offer my customer that no one else does? List it, write it down, l you know, live it and breathe it every day. All right, your plan's going to position your online presence. Okay? That alone, we could spend two weeks on. All right? Your online pleasant presence is really important. I'm going through this right now with a Chinese company. Okay? And, you know, it's not, just about, it's not just about your website. It's also about all the hashtags that go with it. It's about all the blogging that you want to do, or maybe none. Right? It's about all the search engine optimization that needs to be done behind that and the data analytics that you get out of that. Really important information. It's, it's going to position your marketing plan. Your marketing will. Marketing plan. Right. Oh, now we get it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, your, uh, you know, it's going to be your offline presence. Okay. So for you, right, I've, you've targeted, you've identified Jetta. Okay. Now how are you going to get to those people? What's the plan for that? What are the events that you're going to go to? What's the local advertising you're going to do? Right? How are you going to, how are you going to, exp uh, how are you going to sp expenditure that? Right? Yeah. There's a lot to it. So, you know, but this plan, this is what you guys have to do over the next couple of weeks is put this plan in place. It isn't going to be cast in stone. It's going to keep changing. Right? But this is, you know, it's a, it's a platform for you to launch. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, again, as I said, this to me is probably the most important thing. It's going to, what you've been going through and what you're going to do is going to effectively make you target your, your you know, laser focus on your customer. Right? It's very, very important to do that. Uh, right. Other things that it's going to do, I don't know, it might help you offer incentives to the right individuals, right? So, you know, there might be certain plans that as you launch your company, you think, you know what? Over here, my competitor does this. I could get that customer over here if I offered them this type of incentive to come try my product, right? So think about you know, your initial go-to-market launch, right? And again, I'm staying away from disc the word discount. It's not about price. It's about how you're better. All right, competitive analysis. It's not just about building a company that's better but it's going to help you handle your objections from your customers. Because they're going to come back and say, well, so and so does this better. Ah, but they don't do this. Or have you asked them about this turning to a positive as opposed to a, look at me, I'm selling great. Yeah? Have you asked them, how do they handle this? How do they handle that? Right? Because guess what? Over here at Trido, we do this. Okay. This is one of the best things that this thing's going to do, your marketing plan. It will help you define your roadmap. Okay, so we're going to talk about marketing requirements in a minute, but it basically will define the path you're going down. Because your customers, as you keep talking to them and say, well, why did you buy from me? Don't be afraid of asking the question, why did you buy from me? Well, because I liked, it wasn't about the, the comic, it was about the quality of the paper. I like the feel of it. Fabulous information to receive back. Yeah? Why didn't you buy from me? Yeah, it was a great story, but it was on really crappy paper. You know? Didn't, didn't, just didn't feel right in my hands. Seriously, you'd be amazed at why people buy, right? Product roadmap. So, 
that point would be my next generation of products. I need to up my game on the, the paper I'm using, right? Lastly, as I said, we talked about this, but it's going to determine you know, your overall strategy of your, you know, for sales and marketing. Again, as you grow, money's going to start coming in. Hey, I need a sales guy. OK, well, what does that mean? Um, I don't know. Is that somebody just picking up the phone? All right, is that an inside salesperson? Is that an outside salesperson? Very different price points, right, for those individuals. Yeah, I might need to go make sure I've got another 50 you know, guys to deliver. Okay, uh, how are you going to you know, incent them to come and work for you? All right, I started with this picture. I want you to put your eyes here, okay? Hopefully you can work that out. Somebody on their phone in bed at you know, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. This is your customer today. They are very educated. Everybody in this room is on their phone. Before they go to bed, last thing you do, right? Oh, God, check my phone. See what happened on Facebook. See what happened on this. And then, you know what? Some other people are going, you know what? Tomorrow I might buy a pizza. Where can I get that from? Because I don't want to go out. Who's going to deliver that for me? Oh, let's go read the reviews on Surrey. Or let's go read the reviews on Twitter. Right? They are extremely educated. This is the first generation that your buyer is extremely educated. It's never been this way before. Okay? So you look at this here, right? Customers in control. All these places that they need to go, they go to get information from before they even contact you. You need to figure out what your presence is relative to whatever logos are up here which makes sense for you. Okay, maybe some are up there that don't, that, that uh, you know, I haven't, you know, locally realized, but find out what they are and make sure you have a presence, because that's where they're going to go to get this information. And they're going to go and do all of this before they even pick up the phone and talk to you. Okay? Before, the world I grew up in was this. Marketing did all the awareness, the interest, it threw papers out there. You know, advertising local papers, the web was just beginning in, beginning in the mid-90s, and, you know, web presence was very small, right? So they did all of that, and that was great. Threw it over the wall and said, okay, sales, we've done our bit. It was up to us, right, in a sales environment to take that customer who's considering our product, figure out what their intent is to buy, walk them through evaluation, if that was, the, you know, the case, and get them to the purchase. That was all sales. Now all the other way around because of this, this thing up here. Okay, they do all of this before they get here. All right, you guys following what I'm saying there? Yeah? All right, so I go back to, again, your marketing campaigns. It's not about, you know, getting just basic information out there. It's about getting a lot of information out there in a professional way relatively quickly, right? Remember what I said before? Big boys. Big boys can come in and target your exact laser focus to a, a customer that they couldn't do before. For the same reasons that you can, because of the internet. All right. If there's one word you take away from this, your marketing plan and your marketing um, you know, strategy that you do, constantly iterate on this. Okay? Do something, measure it, analyze it, Correct it, step and repeat. Keep doing it. Ask your, continuously ask your customers, why did you buy from me this week? What is it that you really liked? Yeah? You will always have a new customer to talk to. And go back to the old ones. If they're suddenly not buying anymore, go back and say, hey, it's not a sales call. I'm not trying to sell you my stuff. I just want to know why you're not buying from me now. Well, I found a cheaper service somewhere else. Bingo. Go research that, find that out, what the hell's going on, right? A new strategy, a new tactic now you have to develop to protect that barrier of entry. As I said, what we're going to talk about now is marketing requirements and pro uh, product requirements. Okay? So I'm stepping out of all the things which I just said, and this is the last bit of the marketing you know, that we're going to talk about today and this week. All right? Okay, hopefully you're kind of familiar with this type of thing. You guys are kind of over here. You went, hey, I've got a great idea. Well, I'm going to define what that idea is. I've got an idea of what I want to do. And I'm going to do some, you know, some research. I conceive my product. I'm going to analyze my market requirements. I'm going to define those product requirements. We're going to talk about that. 
hey, I'm going to go design my product. Well, that's great. OK, so we're into construction. So we're designing, we're developing, big test, right? Make sure it walks, works, and we're going to launch. OK? And then, you know, we're going to sustain the product. And then, guess what? At some stage, you're going to end of life that product because you've got a new thing coming up. All right, these are the normal stages of product development. You guys are probably over here, right, somewhere, to be fair. But this is, this is how it does. This is how it happens. How do you prepare yourself for all of these stages? How are you going to manage all of these stages? Right, you're going through the marketing stuff now. There's engineering going on, you know, on the left-hand side to make sure that, you know, they're developing the product. Who are they developing it for? What are they developing? Those are things we're going to talk about. All right? Anybody seen this diagram before? Yeah? If you've done an engineering you know, course at school, it's usually one of the first things that uh, you know, it puts up. I put it up here not just to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but you, know, you go talk to your customer. Hey, what do you want? Hey, I want this fabulous swing. I want three people to sit on it, and I want it on the big tree at the end of my yard. Fabulous, Mr. Customer. I understand exactly what you want, and I know how to go develop it. So. The project leader took it away, and in his mind, he's thinking, I know what I've got to do. This is it. Yeah? He throws it over to the analyst. The analyst goes, he says to the analyst, he goes, hey, yeah, just look. What we need is a swing on a tree. Can you do that? Swing on a tree. I'm an engineer. OK, it's got to go through the tree and swing. I've got to put two branches up. He gets all really technical, right? Anyway, so you can run through it all, right? How the programmer wrote it, how the beta tester received it, right? <laughs> Oh, look, how the sales guy sold it. Yeah, massive, comfy chair with the sun shining in the background. OK? And look at that, how the project was documented. No testing, right? No documentation. Yeah. Who's guilty of this right now, right? I mean, it's, it happens every time. Ah, we'll test it later on, OK? Um, what happens when the <laughs> operations installed it? Well, they forgot the seat, right? They just put the rope up. That's good enough. It'll do, you know? What the customer was built. Well, we've done all this work. We built it for a roller coaster. <laughs> um, oh, and how it was supported. Uh, it failed, so we chopped the tree down. You know, okay. And all of it at the end, and how marketing. Oh, look, here's our marketing. We advertise it as the ice wing. Right? <laughs> Great marketing, future technology. And what the customer really received at the end of the day was a tire. Right? Not what he wanted. Okay. The whole purpose of what we're going to talk, to talk about in the next you know, half an hour is how do we avoid that? Okay? Because again, you will all be guilty of this. This is your baby. This is your idea. Okay? So you're going to design it how you want it to look. And that's fine. That's great. Until your customer goes, well, what if you could just tweak it here? Or what if you could tweak it there? Or, you know what? That's really nice, but that's not what I want. Okay, so my point is save yourself a lot of time, go talk to your customers early on. Yeah? Now, again, I'm not so naive to think you can't, you have to get what's cool, you'll go into this in the engineering section or the technological section. You've got to get minimal viable product out there, you've got to get into the market, right? But again, keep talking, keep changing, keep listening, right? Yeah? I would bet my mortgage that any com that right now all of you that are developing systems online might have limited documentation for your engineers. Hands up. I mean, you'd, no, I'm not going to call you on it. Or no documentation. Or, you know, nothing, you know, yeah. You know, one of your designers probably comes in because he's had a sleepless night and goes, I've got a great idea. And he goes, fix, done, out the door. Oh, another problem over here because you're in firefighting mode right now. Yeah, it happens, you know. What I'm saying to you is, again, just think about a process. Don't get so process laden, okay? This is one thing I want you to take away from this, is don't get process laden with stuff. You're not a big company, but have some level of process because it will save you a bunch of time in five years when you're into bug fixing, right? Or three years when you're into bug fixing, you're adding a new feature then an engineer can pick up a document, look at it, understand it, and go, OK, I got it. I know what to do. Right? Can I add to that a little bit? Yep. So, so you know, having gone through this multiple times myself, my own companies, it, it, you guys may be in the same boat. So you come up with a great idea, and you build technology, and you get it out there, and you, you get some traction. Some people like it. 
And so now you're kind of caught, well, what do we do? So you know, your number one thought is, well, let's just keep building and iterating on this technology plan and we're going to go this direction. Without talking to customers, you're just going to keep going this way. But eventually, if you're smart and you do what Dylan's recommending and you start getting feedback from your customers, you may want to turn your technology. We call that a pivot. Right? And if you start to pivot, you're getting closer to what your customers really want. And in my case, we're building a, we're building a cloud technology. Right? And this is when cloud was first coming up. And so we were going down this road and we were just marching and I had Cisco over here. It'd be great if they bought us, but you know, they, they eventually we started talking to them and they said, well, yeah, what you're doing is, is okay, but boy, if you, if you did this, this, and this, it'd be a lot better for us. And so we were, okay, well, let's just turn a little bit this way and we did those things. You know, and this went on for a year. And they come back, well, if you could do this, this, and this, it'd be great for us. But by listening to them, eventually they just said, you know what, we're going to buy you. Because you got exactly what we need. Right? So you got to listen. And the companies that survive and the smart companies, the smart leaders, the quicker you can le you learn to listen to your customers and start driving customer requirements into your technology roadmaps, the better off you're going to be. I and can't it, stress that enough. It? Yeah, and it, it doesn't, it, you know, this is not just about technology, right? It might be about, you know what, we really like your service, but, God, I wish you could deliver avocados all year round, right? I mean, seriously, it might be just something baseline as that, that you hadn't even thought about. In which case, find a supplier, get it all sorted, and now you can do it, right? Or it might be, hey, you know, I wish you could, like, link me through to Uber so I, I could press that button on a taxi. You know, just in case I need to, you, your doctor's telling me I've got to go to straight away. And the Uber's on its way to pick me up. Yeah? That's basically the same, as you say, positioning the value of our product to the value of our customers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And your customers, and they're, as Ken just said, right, Cisco, his customer, his eventual customer, and the, the acquisition that was done there, he created a new roadmap based on what they wanted. Right, he was heading in a direction. His customer said, "Hey, if you like this, this, and this, oh well, yeah, great, we can do that." Yeah, listen to, listen to your customers. Right, I started there two weeks ago. Right, become a medical doctor. Tell me more. All those things. Hmm, why did you buy from me? It's valuable information. All right. Okay. So that's great. So how do you capture those things? Okay. What does your customer tell you? What that's called is a, it's called a marketing requirement. And you capture that in a marketing requirements document. Okay? What's in it? These things. It's focus definition of the market is, the buyer and user, the buyer and the user profiles. There are only really two profiles. One is a buyer, one is a user. Each one has different requirements, okay? The buyer is buying on price, right? Maybe some other things. The user is using on functions, right? You understand the difference? Yeah? I really like using, you know, Noda Nota. Why do I like using? The button is in the right place for me to quickly go, well, I'm over here on my cell phone. It might be something like that. But that's a marketing requirement to have the button at that position, yeah? Or I like the speed of operation, yeah? Or an, a buyer might be saying to you, yeah, I really like the price point. Or I don't like the price point, whatever it may be, but that, you can change it and change that into a marketing requirement. Question for you, Dan. Yeah. Uh, can the buyer and the user be the same person? Yeah, oh yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Right, so she realized that too. Right? But even even if it's the same person, think about it in terms of two different you know aspects. Right? And there's a there's a, a conscious buying decision they're making and then there's a functional use of your product decision that they're doing. We're gonna get I think we're gonna go into that in a in a little while. Alright. What it's not is what I referred to earlier as the product document okay all right there is a clear differentiation between the two now i will be quite open with you you can go on the you know google and you'll find people that say they're not they're the same thing in my opinion and that's all i can share with you is they are not and i'm going to explain why okay 
All right. So this is to your point, right? So a buyer is concerned with value. A user is concerned with capabilities. Each one has their own problems. Each one has a problem at a frequency. You must capture those and clearly express them. Yeah? So, as an example on Nota Nota, right? I like the product. I like the way the product um, uh, creates perfume inside 30 minutes. Right? Or let's now turn it into a requirement. I'd like that product to create perfume in 25 minutes. Okay, so now you have a requirement. Right? It deals with these three things, the what's, the why's, and the who. What's the problem? Why is it a problem? And who's it a problem for? Anybody know what word's missing? From this, this, what would be on the other side of this, this little square here? Huh? Right. So, it's not missing, okay? Because this is the difference, and it's a, it is a very subtle difference, but it's very important to understand it. The marketing requirement documents deals with the what's, the why's, and the who's. You make the statement. It doesn't address how to deliver on that point, okay? We'll go into the reasons of what the PRD is in the, me in, 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 in the moment, okay? But it's important that you have, you're going to go from an abstract, right, to a clear statement. You're going to take that statement and you're going to make it a functional stroke technical representation. Now we're into the PRD. The MRD is not technical in any shape or form, okay? Yep. So. After Cisco bought my company, I ended up inside of Cisco. I ran cloud engineering for two and a half, three years inside of Cisco. So we had a team of 300 people who were building the next generation of cloud components. There's an enormous marketing arm inside of Cisco, and they would come to us you know, every month with an MRD. Here's what our customers want. Can you build this? And Diane's absolutely right. We had no input as engineers into the market requirements. Our job was to figure this out. So we took that market requirements and we did the PRDs, which was, okay, how are we going to solve those requirements? Now, that's in a big company with a lot of formalized processes and a lot of you know, structure to make things don't fall through the cracks. You guys aren't to that point yet, so you're gonna have to deal with all of this at the same time. But, but in the back of your mind, you realize, and I think Donald's absolutely correct, I would argue that there's a, a fundamental separation between MRDs and PRDs. And the sooner you start to think that way as, as the business owners and the people building your technologies, the better off you're going to be. If you yeah. continually try to push these things together, you're going to make mistakes. And then there's, a, there's a reason why mistakes happen, because, right, we're going to go into this, but basically, when you're doing your customer surveys, limit the people that are doing it, okay, because you are going to run into, if you bring an engineer into the room, He's not going to listen to the customer. He's going to say, you want, oh, you wanted that swing? Let me tell you how I can do it. Let me how I can do it with speed and better, right? And you're going to end up with this function that you didn't want as the CEO of the company. And again, you can take technology out of the statement and you can apply it exactly to what you're doing as well, right? Don't bring your artists to meet the customer, yeah? Only at you know, networking events and stuff, right? But the artist will be like, oh, look at all these great ideas I've got. And it's not listening to what the customer wants. Yeah? So when you're doing your market requirements, okay, first line is absolutely true. You're never going to hit 100%. Okay? You're not. You know, even the first iPhone that came out is on version 10 right now, right? So you're never going to hit everything first time around. But you are going to hit some of them, and that's important. Um, if there's one takeaway, it's this, you know, spend as long as you possibly can and talk to as many people as you can, right? You will get, we keep on, you know, kind of hitting you over the head with this message, but you will get the information you're looking for by speaking to your potential customers, customers, you know. Right, right, remember I started here again way back when, a week ago, right? Become that four-year-old child, but why, Daddy? Why are we doing that? Why is that important? Why do they have to? Why, 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 why? I, and it says up here, ask why five times. Yeah? 
to your customers or your potential customers. Ask why five times. So for your guys, for the 25-year-olds that want your service, well, why do you want it? I mean, it might be obvious, but it might not be. You know, it's those little nuggets that you're looking to pull out, okay, that you can now refine your offering to meet their needs. Um, here, deliver those, you know, to the client as quickly. You know, when I met you, or when you told me, when I called you last week, you told me that you needed this, this, and this. Is that still the case? Oh, no, I didn't care about those two top things anymore. I was just, you know, oh, really? Why not? Okay, so did I capture it right? Give the information back. Is this what you said? Yeah? So if I could provide you all these things, does that meet with what you want? Yeah? Make sense? So keep talking, right? Keep talking. Keep talking to the client. Um, all right. This is a really important slide for gathering those MRDs. Okay? Think about this a lot. Okay, and the, the, it's the top line here I want you to think about. What's your relationship with your customer? Yeah, I, I, I urge all of you to take advantage of that. Right? It's free, right? And free is pretty good. Um, conduct interviews, obviously, and get customer service feedback, okay? Send out those emails, send out those, you know, hey, could you, do you mind spending two minutes on this? It won't take you five minutes to write the email. You can blast it out to, you know, 50,000 customers. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to kind of walk you through a kind of dumbed-down example, right, in terms of what, again, what I mean by a marketing requirement, right? Hey, I want a cup of coffee. That's what I want. Just give me a cup of coffee. That's your market requirement. Well, not quite. We need to dig a little bit, right, behind that. Because you're over here saying, I provide coffee. Yeah, but I want a cup of coffee. I've got coffee. Oh, great. So you give them a nice latte. That's not what I want. Nobody asked me what I wanted, right? So my market requirements are, you know what? I want coffee that tastes good, is a decent temperature, and costs, costs you know, pretty reasonable. Great, I got it. Not quite, right? So you turn around, you provide them, an, uh, you provide them a warm latte. Yeah, it's not warm enough, or it's too acidic, right? So you've got to identify where the taste criteria are, or the critical criteria are needed for that particular purchase, right? And this is it. I want it not acidic. I don't want it between somewhere and that and rich. I'm, that's my kind of uh, uh, temperature that I like drinking my coffee, and boy, you better be under three bucks a copy, uh, you know, a, a cup. Those are my requirements. That's a marketing requirement. Notice I haven't said anything functional, right? How are you going to create a system now, right? Going to the, this would go into a PRD. How do I determine what's acidic, non-acidic, right? How do I determine, how do I get to, you know, above 60 and below 80 degrees, right? What's the function that causes that feedback loop to happen from an engineering perspective? Same as, you know, what happens if I go above three bucks? What happens if I go, you know, down to a buck, right? So that's, you're turning those into product requirements now. But from a marketing requirement, I've gone from I want a cup of coffee to as long as it meets these things, I'm okay, you got me as a customer. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, so, many positive. so did you guys go through this process when you built your machine? Uh, you, mean, you probably had to go through at least some of this to, to kind of come up with the concept and the design so that you, you had you know, some level of understanding what a customer would want out of that thing, right? Yeah, but it was uh, mostly assumptions. Assumptions? Okay. The same as the point. Yeah, but, but whose assumptions? Based just on you as, as your, your group building this? Yeah, we made, yeah. We, made, we made a couple of surveys, but not direct surveys. Yeah. Uh, how many times do you change your perfume? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Again, don't confuse being a startup, right, with, you know, again, getting a first generation product out there. But once you get that out there, now start getting that feedback because it might be the button needs to be a bit to the left. It might be if you put a nice little graphic screen on it, it made sense. It might be stick a Bluetooth connection in it and make it run on my phone. You know, that's what I'm really looking for. You heard of Juicero? Did you hear of a company called Juicero? For those of you who don't know, Juicero 
500 million dollars were invested into them, okay, in, the, in Silicon Valley. Does everyone know this story or not? No? I, don't, I, I, I knew you would, right? Okay. Sometimes in our industry, they're just legends, right? Ah, yeah. Things that either go really well or things that go really Right, so Juicero, Juicero, as the name says, was a juicer. Yeah, it was a juicer. And their claim to fame was, hey, you know, getting on the bandwagon of all healthy eating, right, which is, you know, big in the US, it's big in Europe, I assume it's big here too, right? And so, you know, what they decided was, hey, we're going to do a subscription service for our customers, and they buy the machine, right, that's going to juice this juice packet that every month, under their subscription service, they're going to get a number of them, right? The machine came in at, what was it, 800 bucks, wasn't it, first of all? Yeah? So for a, for a juicer, I mean, that was the, there was the product cost, they could get down to 800 bucks. Customers were like, the feedback from customers were like, hey, unless it's 300 bucks, well, well, you know, everyone has in their head, we'll spend 399 bucks, right, on product. Yeah, Apple's kind of changing that game right now, but it's 399 was what everybody thought they'd spend on home electronics, gateways, iPads, whatever it is. Point being is they came in at 800 bucks. So they had early adopters, they got it down, and they were trying to get their product pricing down. Anyway, cutting a long story short, one of the investors that did not invest in their first round of 500 million took one of the pouches, and he squeezed it with his hand, and it was the same amount of juice, and it was the same quality as what came out of the machine. Business got killed, company was shut down. I mean, it was literally, there's more to it than behind that. They couldn't get their, you know, their manufacturing costs to where they needed to be and a bunch of other things. But literally, you know, what bad press, right? Squeeze the packet into a glass, exactly the same quality as what came out of the juice out. You know, I mean, something as basic as that, right? $500 million they got invested. They were claiming that the push the machine was a big distance. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was just a classic, just kind of a meteoric rise followed by just a, like a straight into the ground. And fantastic. Yeah. I anyway, just, you know, there's a lot, but, you know, the valley is full of stories like that, right? But it's, you know what? Hey, 500 million, somebody believed in them, right? Okay, so you kind of get the concept of this market requirements now, yeah? So what happens with the MRDs, okay? We're going to turn them quickly into PRDs. All right, product requirements documents, okay? This is where we start bringing in the word how, all right? So we did the what, the why, and the when. Now we're doing the how. How are we gonna do it, okay? Um, I just put this up again for reference, all right? So, you know, we're gonna, there's all your marketing requirements. So how do you create the functions that surround those, okay? So in this document, again, don't take all of this as heavy, heavy process, right? It's a standard practice, right? You can make these documents as small or as big as you guys want, right? But basically, you're going to take the things in that come in from the MRDs. You're going to turn these into functional requirements, usability requirements, technical requirements, right? Security, network, platform, integration, right? You're going to look at environmental requirements. You're going to look at certification requirements. You're going to look at all the things that you have to do. For Nota Nota, you know, you've got to make sure kids don't burn themselves on the product, right? You've got to have all that CE and kite marks and what have you on your products, right? They're going into homes. You're going to put some, you know, constraints around there, what the dependencies are, right? What happens if scenarios are going to go in all of this? High-level workflows. Timelines, milestones, when do you need to get things done and by when, okay? So, remember, this is a PRD. So, your customer said, I want a cup of coffee. You've translated that into a certain range, certain taste, certain something, right? Well, and he wants it by tomorrow, okay? Or he wants it by next month. Now you've got a month to go develop that. That's your overall requirement. But how long does each one of these functions take to develop? Okay, now... The crossover to engineering is starting to appear, right? So as Ken was saying, no engineers inside Cisco get involved with the marketing requirements, yeah? So now more engineers get involved in product requirements, but you probably still have a marketing guy in the room, right, helping to orchestrate some of that. But they're slowly moving out now, 
right? Because it's, you've clearly defined it, you've done it well, you've gone into your PRD, you should be able to hand that over to engineering to deliver something in line with that specification. So what happens now? You go to the dark side. You go into engineering, okay? And this is no joke. This is what you're going to kind of go through on the technological side of things. You've got test specs. You've got requirement specs. You've got product specs. You've got Gantt charts. You've got deliverables. Ah, the list goes on, right, from an engineering perspective. You can remove the word engineering, and it's the same thing from a publication perspective, right? You've got an artist who's got to draw something. You've got to line content with that. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to bring all that together on a piece of paper and get that logistically out the door on a, in a certain timeline. So. Hey, good guy. I tell you now, computer science, I found my lightsaber and went over the other side, man. I really did. So all right. Marketing side or the side? Yeah, well, we can, we can debate that till cows come home, right? I mean, I, I just, I can't, and I got, I think I got, two reasons I got spoiled, right? Um, in a bad way. I did a, a very technical degree, which was, you know, just math, right? Math and, and programming and software and literally doing breadboards and designing little pieces of hardware. I did that for four years. <laughs> Okay, I went from there and I worked for a defense company. I think I told you guys this. I was in a porter cabin surrounded by barbed wire inside a barbed wire facility. And I was like, is this the rest of my life? And I just, I had to move into the, the other side. Um, but some people love the engineering side and hey, we, we wouldn't have products without those guys. So, you know, it's just the way it is. All right, okay, so this is where I stop, right? From a market, marketing perspective. I'm going to be back in a couple of weeks. You're going to do the, the engineering one or the technical one. I'll be back after that. And we're going to go, we're going to take all of this and we're going to put that into a commercial model, right? How do we sell it? How do we position it? How do we really take positioning statements and make them work? How do we handle budgets? How big should our sales organization be, right? What's our projection and what's our growth part to move to a, and, and to map a company against that from a sales perspective, okay? But, Henry's going to come, this is Henry, by the way. Henry's coming back and going to teach you all about engineering. All right, so before I move to the last couple of slides, and I literally only have two more slides, two or three more slides. Do you guys get the concept of MRDs versus PRDs? Right? And, and please, you know, try and, try and divorce the two a little bit, because the temptation will be, you're over here as, you know, you own this company, it's your baby, to tell these people what they want. It really will be a huge temptation. Okay, and if you can avoid doing that, the better for you guys in the long term. Can I say that PRD is how to implement MRD? Oh, uh, uh, is this right? Yes, 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 yes. And MRD provides the input to the PRD. Input yeah, the yeah. But you said it the other way around. But yeah, you said implement. But you're absolutely right. It's the implement. The PRD is an implementation of the MRD. Okay. All right, that does literally conclude all the marketing stuff. I'm not sure if we're going to have time. We do want to go through your elevator pitches with you. Again, it's not, we're not trying to test you. We're trying to prepare you for Gintech, Jitex, right? You will be asked, okay? This is why we said to all the executives, whenever you bump into any of the startups, just to ask them what they do. Because it's important for you to be able to just regurgitate this, articulate this clearly and concisely and with, you know, People believe you. That's the most important thing. All right, final thought. I mentioned this right at the start, but here's a couple of things. There are countless, beyond countless things out there that are free. And I strongly suggest you use things that are applicable to you, okay? So for example, if you didn't know this in LinkedIn, slash learning, there's a pile of videos that are people standing up and doing stuff like this, okay? From strategy to sales to engineering concepts to business concepts. They're all free. Just go click around. It's a bit like YouTube. Go to YouTube. Pile on YouTube of, you know, people who've done startups. Watch videos. Learn as much as you can from everybody, or, you know, wherever you can get information from. 
Um, does anybody know about Google Analytics? Yes. All right, okay. Yeah, you can be certified to it. I don't know if you know that. There's a bunch of courses that you can do, right, with inside Google Analytics. If you're not using Google Analytics for your website, it's free. It's great. It tells you how many hits you had, where they were hit, when they were hit. It's good information. And again, it's good data for you to understand how long they spent on your website, what page they spent the longest on. All of this is freely available. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it help you with things like your search engine optimization, right? You're familiar with terms like this? If you're not, become familiar with these because your SEOs are the keywords inside your website that Google search engine and Yahoo and Microsoft Bing pick up on. They have millions of bots going to all the websites in the world every day, right? These bots are going, this is how the search engines work, right? They go to the websites, they pick out keywords, they bring it back, they put it into some incredibly proprietary algorithm, yeah? So that's, how, that's what Google makes its money on. But they spit that out in an order that appears in your search window. When you say, search on Manchester United, bing, comes up with all these you know, gazillion results with five at the top. That's because it's gone out to all the websites in the world and it's where it can get to and it's found this information. So, it's called search engine optimization. Make sure you have keywords that the Googles of this world will pick up on. All right, um, if you're not using a kind of sales customer relationship you know, management tracking tool, again, it's really useful to do this. As you start getting customers, you're going to get, start getting or opportunities to convert those to customers. You're going to start saying, well, where am I storing this information? Excel spreadsheets are great, but they can only kind of manage you a little bit because it's just about the finance side. These CRM tools that are, are out there, you can do all of your mail shots to your customers. You can keep a repository of their addresses and who they are, as well as doing all of the sales management stuff. And they're free for the amounts of customers you guys are going to have initially. Okay? So, like all things in life, right, the bigger you get, then these guys, are, if you're going to stay with them, they're going to come back and ask, like, Salesforce, you know, a, a chunk of money for you to use their services. But initially, they're all free. Go look at them. Best one is networking, right? And customer referrals are the best things that you can get. It's free marketing. If somebody likes what you do, they will tell their buddies. And then their buddies will tell somebody else and that does proliferate very, very quickly. Okay, if you're good at what you do. So keep that going. I think I probably showed this to you, but what is your company's greatest asset? Right? It is you. You are, that's why your elevator pitch is so important, especially at this side, right? When you are talking to investors, they're evaluating you as a risk factor. It's not just about your product. They're evalu evaluating you. Can I invest in this person? Is this person going to take this company to where they need to be? Or is this person cool? And the technology is fabulous, but as an investor, I'm already thinking I'm going to have to bring in a CEO. That may not be bad, because again, put your hands up and figure out where your strengths and your weaknesses are, right? It may not be bad. You may not want it initially, because it's your baby, but right, it's all about getting you to the end game, and you have to feel and flow with where you want to go.